Okay, everybody, welcome back to Terrible Fishing. I know my river projects have been pretty negative. Sorry, George. It's just the way I feel and the way most people do feel about the initial drawdown. So I am going to present something more positive today with much more answers. So let's watch my funny intro. <laughs> Okie dokie. <clears throat> so, let's, uh, this is a KRRC um, conference call in order to um, answer the progress, what's going to be happening. And then at the end, there'll be a Q&A and um, an email you can actually use. So it's about 20 minutes long. So I'm going to put myself in a little box down at the bottom. I am wearing my headsets because, you know, so I can hear it. So we're going to put me there. We're going to put you there. And everyone, we'll just take a moment. Folks, this time I'm going to keep the intro a little bit shorter than my previous videos. Oh, wait a minute. I will be talking to William Simpson. We have a lot That's of not here. right. Uh, we'll... That's not right. There we go. We're back. All right. Here we go. She'll ta start talking any second. I may pause it, you know, in the middle of it, so... Uh, where is it? KRRC. Yeah, that's right. Should be able to hear it. All right. Hello, everyone. There they go. My name is Ren Brawnell. I'm the Public Information Officer with the Klamath River Renewal Corporation, the entity tasked with overseeing the removal and restoration. <laughs> of the, the Klamath Hydroelectric Dam Removal Project. Um, today we're here to provide um, an update as to how the drawdown period went and where we're going with restoration. Um, if you guys have any questions along the way, we're gonna start off with the presentation. Feel free to ask those in the chat and I'll pose them to Mark and Dave once the presentation is complete. And with that, I'll have Mark and Dave introduce themselves and we'll get started. Well, good morning, everybody. I'm Mark Bransom, the Chief Executive Officer of the Klamath River Renewal Corporation. And good morning. I'm Dave Kaufman, uh, Resource and Environmental Solutions Director of Northern California Southern Oregon Operations and Program Manager for Restoration on the Lower Climate Project. So we've got a presentation to give you all an update on uh, where things are. This is a very exciting time for the Klamath River Renewal Project, and we're pleased to have the opportunity to uh, to brief you all. So thanks again for, for joining. Just as a quick reminder, these are the four dams that make up the Lower Klamath Hydroelectric Project, starting in the lower left corner at the top of the river system, the J.C. Boyle Dam, uh, uh, coming down river, then Copco Number 1, the former Copco Number 2 Dam, and uh, the lowest of the four dams on the river, Iron Gate. So for context, here is uh, a map of the Klamath River watershed. Uh, you can see the four dams connected in the middle by the uh, purple line there. Uh, important to note that these four dams basically bisect the Klamath watershed into a lower and an upper region and of course have blocked the migration of fish and other species up and down the river as a result of uh, this bisection. So last year, uh, after taking uh, ownership of the uh, of the four dams and the appurtenant uh, facilities at the end of 2022, we spent 2023 making preparations for the drawdown uh, and dam removal. 
uh, one of the things that we accomplished during the summer and early fall of 2023 was the removal of the Copco number two dam. Copco number two was a small dam. It did not create a reservoir. Uh, it was a small diversion dam that diverted uh, water uh, released from Copco number one just up above it, uh, diverted that uh, uh, water from uh, from the uh, from the, the the river into a tunnel and down to a powerhouse. Uh, the location of Copco number two would have created uh, unnecessary interference with the drawdown of Copco number one. So we took advantage of time uh, and resources we had available uh, last year to re fully remove the Copco number two dam. And there you see a picture of the former uh, dam up above and the bottom picture uh, following dam removal and, and restoration of the channel. So just for some definitional context, we refer to the initial drawdown phase, which we have just completed as the opening of low level outlets at the dams and the draining of the reservoirs to get down to a free flowing river condition. That is the, 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 uh, the draining out of all of the stored water behind the reservoirs. We refer to final drawdown as the period that comes next, and that is while we have any spring runoff, any spring freshet, uh, and any flood flows have uh, completely passed through the system, and we get back down to a river base flow condition that meets the biological opinion uh, flow conditions for minimum flows. And that is the point then at which we will be prepared uh, to initiate uh, dam removal. Once we're sure that the river has come back down to those uh, minimum flows and we have uh, passed the period of any major flood risk, then we'll get started on removal of the dams. So here's a timeline just uh, showing the various phases of the work. So at the end of last year, uh, we began the operational drawdown. Uh, and we've just completed the initial drawdown phase, as you see there in blue, uh, in the January and early February timeframe, uh, when we brought these um, these reservoirs completely down. We'll talk a little bit more about the rest of this timeline as we wrap up the uh, the presentation. Want to talk a little bit about the sediment uh, that has accumulated behind these dams. Of course, uh, you know, the dams have been blocking the river for over 100 years. Uh, and during that period of time, uh, the presence of those dams has uh, cut off a really important process in a healthy river system, and that is the, the transport of sediment. Uh, we've estimated that there were somewhere on the order of uh, about 17 to 20 million cubic yards of sediment that had accumulated behind the, the dams over the last century. And of that 17 to 20 million cubic yards, uh, we have projected that somewhere on the order of about a third of that sediment or about five to seven million cubic yards would be expected to be mobilized during the drawdown and to travel downstream uh, through the river system and much of that material out to the, the Pacific Ocean, uh, thereby you know, restoring. So I know this is where a lot of our um really hate wearing headphones. I'm only wearing so I can hear it. Um, this is where a lot of contention is. So he uses the word much. Now, I don't know what the definition of much is, but we all know that a lot of that sediment will not, most of it, well, some of it will, will to be accurate right now until I get more accurate information, some of it will actually stay in the river. And especially where the river turns, you're going to have those slow open areas where the river flow slows down and that sediment will actually settle there. Now, he mentions five to seven million cubic yards is what they expect for it to go in, which is the equivalent to what they say is one year of what normally happens. So you're taking what's normally going on the river. So you're you're basically doubling it <laughs> okay so except you're doing it all at one stinking time so i know that's the negative but this is what we are seeing what we're seeing is the five to seven million cubic yards of sediment rushing up and yes it has poisoned the river it has done bad things and it's killed a lot of things so 
not to be negative on this, but that's what we are seeing, and that's what we're responding to. So um, just so you know, as we continue on with their presentation, um, their presentation will answer a lot of these questions, including some of my concerns and some of the um, concerns of the, um, the residents. Now, you're going to hear also some things that, you know, some uh, conditions that they put in there in order to monitor the situation. And I really, really hope that that all comes to fruition and good things happen. So I really am hoping for a vibrant river system. But what we're seeing right now is not. So um, I am going to put my headphones back on. And we're going to start this up and make me littler again. So we're going to make me littler. And we're going to start it up again. A really critical function in a healthy river system. Now, for context, on average, the Klamath River moves roughly five to seven million cubic yards of sediment on a on an annual basis. And so we're introducing essentially the equivalent of one year's worth of sediment. Now, understood uh, that we are introducing that volume of sediment in a shorter period of time. Uh, but for context, uh, you know, it is being done. Uh, during the winter months, uh, when we have, uh, you know, some expectation that we've got the advantage of uh, flow conditions uh, and the uh, least biological impacts. This was the period of um, the year that uh, tribes and fisheries agencies made the decision that would be the best time of the year. Uh, we don't have uh, adult salmon uh, in the river system. Most of the juveniles are up in the tributaries and have not yet started their out migration to the ocean. Uh, and so this was really the optimal time to initiate the drawdown uh, and to mobilize this amount of sediment and send it down the river. Sorry about that. I skip it. Sorry about that. You'll see another I want to one talk a little bit about the uh, drawdown process. This is a picture of Iron Gate Dam and the initiation of drawdown that took place uh, in early January at Iron Gate. We were able to take advantage of existing infrastructure uh, and you can see dead center in the photo, the uh, existing low level outlet tunnel that we opened up to initiate the drawdown. This is a picture of uh, Iron Gate Reservoir uh, and the Klamath River after drawdown. A uh, recent picture, I think just uh, uh, earlier this week or, or last week, uh, what you see is the Klamath River uh, flowing from the top of the picture toward the bottom. And on the left side, this is Jenny Creek. Uh, flowing into the Klamath River, the reconnection at its historic uh, point with. This is actually a presentation that was done on February 15th, just FYI, just for reference. The Klamath River, Jenny Creek is a really important tributary. These tributary streams in the hydroelectric reach are bringing clean, cold water into the river that will serve really important benefits with regard to our restoration objectives uh, for the uh, river. The, uh, Iron Gate Reservoir drained right on schedule, and uh, we came back down to river conditions uh, right up against Iron Gate Dam uh, on uh, Saturday of uh, this last weekend. Here's a uh, drone image of the initiation of drawdown at J.C. Boyle. We blasted out a uh, concrete wall in a uh, culvert under the uh, spillway section of the dam there uh, to initiate the drawdown. And then we have a picture of the J.C. Boyle drawdown uh, sometime later. J.C. Boyle uh, was a much smaller reservoir relative to the size of Copco number one uh, reservoir and, uh, and Iron Gate. And so it drew down uh, over the period of roughly 17 hours. This is a picture of the Copco number one dam. What you see in the middle of the picture there is a steel pipe. Uh, that we put on an extension of a new tunnel that we drilled and blasted through the base of Copco Number One Dam. On the right-hand side of the photo, you see the historic diversion tunnel. We made a decision not to utilize the historic dis uh, diversion tunnel for the drawdown simply because we did not have assurance that the tunnel was in, in adequate 
structural condition and hydraulic condition in order to handle all the flows uh, for uh, the purposes of draining out the reservoir. So we made the decision to go in and uh, create a new tunnel uh, through the base of the dam and uh, utilize that for the purposes of the drawdown. This next picture is uh, the moment of the uh, blast of the concrete plug that was at the upstream face of the dam inside the new tunnel that we uh, created. Uh, it was really inspiring to watch this blast and moments after the blast to see the water and sediment begin to come out from behind the dam. Uh, and over the course of uh, a week, uh, you know, we watched the process of the reservoir completely draining out and getting back down to uh, a river condition flowing in its natural historic channel uh, <clears throat> and very inspiring to, to watch the river uh, reconnect after a full century of being blocked by this, uh, by this dam. This is a picture of Copco Reservoir, again, the uh, Klamath River uh, finding its historic channel and uh, winding its way down through the old uh, reservoir a lot of sediment mobilized and moved through the system <clears throat> uh, exactly according to our, our plans and our projections. Uh, and so we're very pleased with uh, the progress that has been made uh, on the drawdown. I wanna talk just a little bit about the uh, strategy at Copco Reservoir. Uh, in the weeks leading up, as I showed on the timeline, we did lower the reservoir to the minimum operating pool. Uh, the purpose of doing that really was to reduce the amount of water that we needed to release just to shorten up the time. But more importantly, we really wanted to bring the reservoir down to allow the hillsides along the reservoir rim to begin to drain out. We were aware that we had some weak geologic conditions that could have uh, created some slope instability. Uh, and so by pre-draining these hillsides, we actually enhanced the reservoir rim stability and reduce the risk uh, of any uh, foundation movement or settling of the soils and the geologic material that could have impacted any of the surrounding homes. In addition to bringing the reservoir down in advance of drawdown, we wanted to further manage this by, by controlling the drawdown rate. And so we accomplished that primarily by bringing water in from upriver. During the drawdown, what we refer to as the operational drawdown to minimum pool, we agreed with the Bureau of Reclamation that we would release water from Copco and Iron Gate that would offset water that would otherwise have been released from Upper Klamath Lake to allow the Bureau of Reclamation to meet their uh, regulatory requirements to uh, allow a certain amount of water to flow downriver below Iron Gate Dam. And so in exchange for releasing water uh, that the Bureau of Reclamation could hold on to, we released that water uh, from Upper Klamath Lake and Keno Dam uh, during the initiation of drawdown at Copco. And what that basically did was brought a more equal balance of the water flowing out of Copco and the water coming in that allowed us to control that drawdown rate and further reduce the risk uh, to the public of having any um, instability there. And then, of course, we had a very successful full opening uh, of the tunnel to evacuate the sediment and the stored water uh, from behind Copco Dam. Now, I will tell you, since I live next to Upper Klamath, I did not notice a visual difference in water levels because the water levels are being replenished so well from the tributaries and the rivers up north on the lake. So. This actually worked well for them. So just FYI, George, I don't see all things negative. I just report it as I see it. All right, here we go. More stuff. <laughs> so with that, I'm going to hand it over to Dave Kaufman to talk a little bit about some of the uh, restoration activities that are underway uh, and then look forward to turning to some questions. Dave? Thank you, Mark. And first to the group, I'm going to apologize ahead of time. I'm struggling through a cold. So if I have to pause and turn away, that's why. Um, I want to start, we're going to talk restoration, but a, a reminder that the, the project has a lot of what we call resource protection measures in place. Um, and RES is responsible for a number of those, one of which is water quality and sediment monitoring. We have been doing project-related water quality monitoring since uh, 2022. 
Uh, last year, 2023, was the start of the first year of the uh, required water quality monitoring associated with the California 401 water quality certification. Uh, uh, nine uh, or 10, depending on the analyte water quality stations being and monitored uh, starting upstream of J.C. Bull Reservoir on down to the mouth of the Klamath River for uh, either real-time continuous monitoring, water quality grab samples, sediment grab samples, et cetera, uh, building on a uh, decade-plus worth of work done by the Department of the Interior in prior versions of this project um, coordinated through the EPA that uh, back to kind of the, the uh, sediment discussion Mark started earlier really looked into the composition of the sediment, the quality of the sediment, and then, of course, expected uh, potential impacts, short term impacts on water quality uh, downstream of the reservoirs coming from uh, or initiating the drawdown. Uh, so that activity is ongoing. We have crews out collecting water samples, uh, monitoring our, our real time or taking care of our real time water quality data signs. Uh, that, that work is covered collaboratively between the Karuk tribe and the U.S. Geological Survey. Water quality samples being uh, collected physically every two weeks for some analytes, monthly for others. Um, testing being done, reporting made on a, a regular basis, and, and really working to keep an eye on um, the, the short-term impacts and then eventual improvements in water quality that we see resulting from uh, this initialization of drawdown and dam removal on through the restoration phase of the project. Uh, you know, with that, getting into some more of the nitty gritty on restoration, we, we can honestly say now that restoration truly is uh, underway. So we've had revegetation crews out on reservoir sediments since the uh, the 15th of January. So starting with a day or a few days after the, the drawdown of Iron Gate was initiated, we had crews on the ground starting to plant seeds that we've been collecting and propagating since 2018. So as kind of a reminder, um, we've we've collected oh, 13 to 15 million seeds by hand, um, primarily through our, our partnership with the Yurok tribe. Uh, those seeds have been then propagated through yield increase grows at nurseries up and down the West Coast, uh, resulting in a, a seed source of 17 to 20 billion seeds. Uh, that have been started to be mixed into to five plus mixes that are uh, kind of laid down dependent on the conditions that are encountered on the reservoir bottoms following drawdown. Uh, these these seeds are being spread and uh, we'll, we'll show you here in another slide or two is the results of some of that initial work. Um, we've got 98 different species of plants con uh, contained within these seed mixes right now. Um, species that are uh, one can be collected uh, some are, are more difficult than others um, can be propagated and then of course a focus on culturally significant species uh, one of the 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 of course the, the bigger picture that really draws your eye on this slide is the photo of the lupin and well not only is lupin pretty but it's also a nitrogen fixer and we recognized pretty early on that while these sediments these reservoir sediments contain a decent amount of nutrients they don't necessarily contain those nutrients in the right chemical format. And so lupin is one of the species that allows the nitrogen to be kind of fixed um, through the growth process of the plant and then become of other plants that grow in and around the lupin. Um, the um, one point I'll make here is that while the majority of our uh, planting and seeding initially is being done by hand as conditions allow, we will be mobilizing a helicopter within the next few weeks to begin laying down seed in some of the areas where um, we we can't get to physically by, on foot because of of challenging mud conditions. And so, uh, look for that to start happening. We intend to get up and running, as I mentioned, within a few weeks and be wrapped up with that seeding effort by mid March. Um, now, here's here's one of the more exciting photos. These are germinated plants from our revegetation effort. Now, uh, I am a geologist, I am not a botanist, and even our botanists are having trouble identifying the individual species of these plants uh, at this young state. But we can suffice it to say, uh, we're already starting to see the fruits of our years of labor. And so with, with uh, the opportunity I have, I, I wanna give a huge shout out of thanks to the Yurok tribe um, and the Karuk tribe and the, the participants on this not first seed collection effort, 
uh, that turned into a yield increase effort done under contract with these uh, these different grow nurseries, and now again on the ground, and we're we're starting to see uh, the response of the landscape to all the hard work and preparation that's gone into it. Uh, as a reminder, just kind of at a, at a that was certainly a macro scale. This is a much broader scale. Um, as the reservoir sediment has become exposed, what we're seeing is the, the Klamath River in its location where we expect it to be. Um, the river itself is going to continue to chew on deposited reservoir sediments for some time, and we will be seeding right up to the water's edge this year to get vegetation established to start to promote long-term stability of that remaining reservoir sediment that isn't flushed out with drawdown and then with, with rains through the spring. So let's talk just briefly uh, about what's uh, what comes next. So you can see from the timeline here, and I mentioned previously that we're going to be waiting for the spring runoff uh, to pass through the system before we get started with dam removal. Uh, but we do have a number of activities that we will be undertaking in the uh, interim while we're watching the weather forecast and waiting for uh, for that spring freshet to come through. Namely, we're going to get started on the decommissioning of the powerhouses uh, and a variety of other uh, tasks that need to be completed and can be completed while we're uh, uh, anticipating getting started on dam removal in the fall. So I mentioned and showed you a picture of that historic diversion tunnel at COPCO. Uh, we're in the process of uh, getting ready to reopen that historic tunnel so that we can utilize it to direct the river uh, through the diversion tunnel and create a dry working condition for the removal of Copco number one dam uh, and uh, basically repeat the process that was utilized during the initial construction of uh, Copco dam to use that tunnel to create a, a safe dry working condition uh, for the dam uh, construction work. So uh, once we get uh, get to uh, the, the, the spring and uh, see the river back down to a uh, base flow condition, uh, we'll get out uh, and uh, initiate the removal of uh, J.C. Boyle, Copco Number One, and Iron Gate more or less simultaneously. And our objective is to have completed dam removal and have restored a free-flowing river condition uh, in the September, early October timeframe. And depending on uh, you know what we see for the remainder of winter and and the spring, uh, we might even get a jump start on that and wrap that up a little bit earlier. But our current schedule has us going out into the September timeframe, and our goal is to be completely out of the river uh, in time for the uh, fall run uh, and to have reopened some of the upper uh, tributaries and main stem for uh, fish that may be coming through. Uh, so with that, um, let me see what, uh, what comes next. Nobody ever said, let's stop having fun. Sorry for the commercial interruption. Now they're going to do a Q&A. That is actually wraps up our presentation. Um, so please feel free if you have any questions to throw them in into the chat. We I do have one. Oh, we have a couple coming through. So uh, Deb Kroll asks, opponents of the dam removal say that the invasives are going to overcome the native plants. Some also say that they're concerned about where the acorns were sourced. Um, or, or the, I imagine that around sudden oak death. Um, could you perhaps address that, Dave? I can. Um, the the approach that we've taken, recognizing that the entire landscape of the Upper Klamath Basin is chock full of in, invasive exotic vegetation, um, is one of pretreatment um, uh, of the surrounding landscape, then establishment of a native vegetation uh, cover within the reservoir footprint, an early detection and response program for IEV, and then a longer term uh, monitoring and maintenance program. So going back to the beginning feature, um, which was that pretreatment prior to drawdown for three years, we've had crews out treating buffers around uh, Iron Gate and JC Boyle reservoirs for invasive species. And that's consisted primarily of mowing um, at a very on a very limited basis some spot herbicide application to really limit the seed source for those exotic uh, invasive species in the immediate vicinity of the reservoir uh, to hopefully limit their transport downhill into the reservoir sediments. Um, when I talked earlier about the revegetation process, 
we focused our efforts on that reservoir rim. And so we've got kind of a, a little rocky wake area along the reservoir rim and then down into the uh, the reservoir sediments where we recognize because of the distribution or, or disbursement um, processes associated with these invasive species, they're, they're mostly locally blow downhill type seed distribution. And so uh, once you take up the available planting or the available soil real estate with native species, the invasive species aren't able to get a foothold. Now, we also spend an exorbitant amount of time on our restoration sites, walking around, observing things. And so if we, if and when, I'll say, we identify areas where invasive species are maybe starting to get a foothold, we don't wait to develop a, a large scale program to, uh, to address those issues. We attack it head on. We'll get out there if we have to on our hands and knees and, and pull these species out before they go to seed, before they're able to, to cause further issues. Um, and then that process continues for a number of years while we have our, our restoration obligations on the project. So that kind of covers invasive species on the question about sudden oak death, uh, recognizing the concern and of course the, the very real issue. Um, we only sourced acorns from areas that had not been experiencing or have you know, traditionally experienced sudden oak death. I'm You're off of mute. mute. Excuse me. Yeah, I was muted. Thank you for that, Dave. Um, from McKenna Marks with KDRV. Um, Mark, during Tuesday's, during Siski's Super Board of Supervisors meeting on Tuesday, community members shared their concerns and expressed doubt in the success of this project. Is KRRC still confident that the project will accomplish its goal of restoring the Klamath River and bringing back salmon? Yeah, thanks for the question. Uh, you know, I think it's really important to note that the Klamath River is one of the most studied watersheds anywhere in the world. And, you know, specifically, there has been an awful lot of work done uh, to better understand how the river, you know, is likely to recover. We did a significant number of uh, studies and planning, uh, you know, for the drawdown and dam removal. And, uh, you know, I'm really pleased to report that all of the observations and all of the conditions that we're seeing uh, today, you know, are within the boundaries of what we had anticipated, some on the lower end, some on the higher end, but everything is going according to the, the conditions that we had anticipated, uh, given all of the work that we've done. What we're seeing are temporary conditions. These sediments are going to dry out. The vegetation is going to continue to come in. Uh, and the water quality is going to improve as the sediment uh, continues to flush out. So we expect to have recovery of these important water quality parameters that we're monitoring that are having these uh, impacts. And let's just uh, be clear that these are temporary impacts that are within the range of things that we had anticipated, things that we had communicated, things that our regulators affirmed in the permits that they issued for us. Uh, and so I think we just need to take a long view uh, of the processes. And look, we are coming out of over a century of accumulated impacts from the presence of these dams and impacts to the rivers. So let's take a long view uh, and give the river some time. Previous dam removal uh, uh, projects and other landscape scale restoration projects give us lots to be optimistic about that uh, mother nature is going to be on the, the, the recovery and, and, and rebalance here. Uh, it's just not gonna happen overnight and we just need to take a little time and continue to give things a little light nudge where we can do so. As Dave said, job one is to stabilize these sediments in place. That's gonna go a long way to help us uh, improve water quality and, and habitat conditions uh, consistent with the goals for the project. Muted myself again. So just since we're running out of time, I'm going to lump a couple of these questions. Um, we have quite a few about the the death, particularly about the non-native fish that um, we saw after we initiating drawdown. So Dave, maybe could you touch on why we saw the death of these non-native species and why there wasn't more of a relocation effort performed on these species specifically? Sure. Thanks, Ren. And I think you you started the response adequately by uh, 
pointing out that these are non-native species that we're seeing um, that have, have died as a result of the, the drawdown and, and change in conditions. Um, the species that we're primarily talking about are yellow perch, crappie, black bass, a handful of other um, warm water lake species that were introduced to these impoundments for fishing. Um, there was not an effort to capture and relocate them because they are a non-native uh, invasive species uh, in a river condition and uh, shouldn't have been here in the first place. And so the resource agencies elected to not um, request or require a capture relocation effort. Um, that, as to why we're seeing the mortality that we are. Just so you know, he's wrong there. Um, at J.C. Boyle, they did do a relocation of species, and they took it over to um, Howard's Prairie. So uh, I don't know what he's talking about. Maybe he's talking about Copco and Iron Gate. But uh, I know at J.C. Boyle, because I saw it, okay, witnessed it, and many other people witnessed it, because I was fishing that day. I think I even got a video of them electrocuting the water and removing the fish. So... Um, just FYI, I don't know why he said that, um, but uh, because it would look better if he said, yeah, we did do that in some cases. So um, just an FYI, I saw them do it at J.C. Boyle. Um, not sure why he gave false information right there. Uh, that goes back to the types of species that they are. They're used to um, uh, call it either calm or, or slightly flowing conditions. Um, slightly warmer water, and it was always expected that these non-native lake species would not be able to persist in a river environment. Um, there are pockets of those species along the Klamath River and some off-channel habitat downstream, and uh, recognizing that they've been washing out of these lakes for decades um, and have established populations down there, those populations are fully uh, occupied or those those habitats are fully occupied to the point where it was always expected and always conveyed that those species would be uh, most likely flushed out during drawdown and perish or um, not make it out of the reservoirs in the first place. So for any questions that we weren't able to get to during this short period of time, feel free to send those my way. Um, I put my email in the chat, so grab that there. Um, it's ren, R-E-N, at klamathrenewal.org. And fortunately with that, we are out of time. But like I said, feel free to reach out with any additional questions. OK, so that is the, uh, turn these things, I don't know how to work the headphones. Um, that's the presentation they gave as of February 15th. Now, um, there are some ambiguities in it, I know, but what we're seeing is what the one gentleman says, it's a temporary thing. Doesn't mean we like it. <laughs> it just doesn't. One of my viewers talked about ripping off the Band-Aid. That's a really good illustration or hyperbole to understand what's happening. So when they ripped off the Band-Aid, it hurts. It just does. So what we're seeing is a what hopefully is a temporary, and I think it is, a temporary poisoning of the the Klamath River. That the uh, the uh, I you know they mentioned that it was communicated. Maybe they communicated to the government U.S. you know U.S. Geological Surveys, but they didn't communicate it very well to the residents. What we were about to see. And one of the many things that I talk about uh, about this project is what can they do better? One, <laughs> I think they could do it better by slowly, you know, uh, drawing down some of the reservoirs. I don't know. I'm not that I'm not a, I'm not gifted in that. You know, my 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 um, my area of, of expertise is um, uh microchips and uh, I know that uh, uh, doesn't seem very practical here but I'm a fisherman and I know a lot about microchips <laughs> so I used to work in Taiwan you know so um, yes I can speak some Chinese <laughs> so the uh, 
but this is interesting that um, during this, you know, they, they, they're doing constant monitoring. I hope they publish that um, publicly and not just keep it within the government realms. I hope what he said is true, is that it's all within the parameters that they expected. Uh, I hope uh, that lots of these things, you know, that the Klamath River will bounce back. And I think it will. Uh, to what extent? I don't know. Is it worth it in the end? I don't know. I, you know, to be honest, it is a true wait and see. You know, they, they do a, uh, a lot of uh, disclaimer caveats. So hopefully this little, um, this discussion, and she did give you her email, and um, would help you guys a little set, set yourselves at ease a little bit. George, I know you think I'm very, very negative about this. And, and, and I probably have been. And, you know, I, I'm not a negative person. I mean, I'm a pretty happy guy. I love fishing. <laughs> I love life. And I've had a great life. Um, what I don't like is, is destruction. Now, this is destruction for, for reconstruction. That's what this is. Now, I do have issues about destroying uh, non-native um, wildlife. I really do have issues about that. I know that you say, well, they're not supposed to be there. And he seems so apathetic when it came to that. I mean, just, um, there has been Hyatt Reservoir and Howard's Prairie Reservoir that were basically fished out and dried uh, during the drought. They could have easily have taken some of the Copco or some of the um, uh, Iron Gate fish also and, and restocked those lakes, among other lakes that are very much like that. During the drought, our lakes went dry here in Southern Oregon. So as they filled in with water, it would have been nice to take more of those fish and put them in those um, areas. I know they did it with J.C. Boyle. Um, so, but J.C. Boyle was the smallest reservoir out of the bunch. Maybe that's why they did it. It's very small. Uh, basically, it was a wide spot on the river. It wasn't really a lake at all. Um, but... Uh, I mean, I fished it a lot because it's only 25 minutes for me. So um, I think they could have done a better job there. Uh, I think they could have done a better job at, at talking to the um, residents. Uh, you heard one of the questions was actually from uh, one, of this, one of the townships. So, and, and they're, 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 um, they're uh, what do you call those guys? Anyway, they were concerned about it. They were not hopeful about it. And it's because lack of communication. So communication is key for any relationship. And when you're talking about um, doing what they have done in this area, and they didn't talk to Klamath Falls, they didn't talk to all those other towns down, downstream, they didn't talk, you know, they really didn't inform people about it. Um, or else... There wouldn't have been so many, so many emotions and um, getting upset. So I hopefully, I know I'm just ranting, I'm just rambling. I apologize. And George, I'm hoping, I know George has been really getting at me. <laughs> I mean nothing by it. I actually like him. I mean, I love the fact that people get, you know, get, you know poke the bear a little bit on this one. Because it causes me to do more and more research. So um, I don't mind it. I really don't. And uh, we, uh, the locals hate what they're seeing right now. But we're hoping that this person is right. That the, we got to look at the long timeline and the bigger picture and hopefully um, see a bounce back of the Klamath River. So I hope, hopefully you guys like this. Um, I will see you guys. I know it's a long video. So uh, one of my longest. So I will see you guys in my next video. We'll do more fishing tips because if you notice some latest videos too, I've been doing a lot of fishing tips. So if you want to know how to catch fish, this is the great place to be. Unfortunately, on the Klamath River right now, you ain't going to catch squat. <laughs> Maybe in the fall, they said, right? I doubt it, but that's what they said. So let's see what happens by fall. Take care, everybody. <laughs>